Hello everybody and welcome back to Weeknight Hero. As always, I am your GM, Evan. Continuing with our campaign building series, we'll be talking about scene creation next. So now that we've established the plot and how it can be broken down into narrative acts, each of those acts can be brought down into groups of scenes that move the plot forward, but that begs the question, what is a scene? So, as I mentioned in the previous video, a scene should have a setting and goal in mind. If either of these change, it might be a good idea to change the scene. Why? Well, depending on the level of experience your players have, giving them open-ended goals might be a valid option. But when they are newer players, the weight of all of the options, skills, and roles can be confusing. The transition of settings and scene signposts to players, I'll let them know that the circumstances of the adventure have changed and that they have the ability to handle a scene in a different way. So for example, I've established that my adventure will be investigation focused and I want the plot to be a psychic serial killer attacking their victims without ever being present to make it the perfect crime. So I want the first scene to be them discovering a victim in their locked bedroom. So the setting is their bedroom. Which other than setting the scene and getting the players to become more invested in the encounter, it also allows the players to visualize where they are and establishes the dimensions of the room. You'll be placing clues that can only reasonably fit inside of a normal bedroom and just as well Ransacking a room for clues is based on the area you're ransacking, establishing a basic difficulty check. So now that you've established a perfect picture in your characters' minds of where they are and what they're looking for, any average person can understand what a bedroom might look like, could be clean or dirty, or have any number of unrelated stuff in the room. So it lets them focus on what they're actually looking for. So, the goal of the scene is to collect clues. How many do you think would be reasonable to get a full picture? I decide that I want them to locate three clues, and the total clues should point directly to a supernatural means of attack. So now that we've established the goal, we can set the difficulty of the encounter. The first thing we should ask ourselves is how difficult should the scene be? If you're going to have them roll, there should always be a chance of success and failure. If there isn't, make it a routine check. If there's a chance of failure, there must be a scenario representing the failed scene. This is a big one because people will usually set themselves up for failure in the scene by complicating it way too much. What is your actual goal? If there isn't a chance of failure, always make it a routine check. I would say 50% of the issues people have with creating scenes and narratives comes down to whether or not it should be a routine check. Next, you should consider the power level. Bonuses to steal checks cannot be more than the power level plus 10. And an effect rank can only be at most twice the power level. So this lets you have clear boundaries for setting the challenge. You're trying to get a truck to stop before it hits a crowd of people. A truck can be mass rank 8, 9, even 10 in a power level 6 encounter is getting less likely. So already right off the bat, it can't be a perception move object power because it would greatly exceed the limits of the power level. And need a character with maybe a effect rank of 6 in their move object. And even if they did extra effort, the most they can go is 7. If they did extraordinary effort, the most they can go is 2. If they did untapped potential, the most they can go is 3. So if all of your characters do not have at least a effect rank of 7 in their move object, they are not going to be able to stop the truck. So maybe we should consider that it shouldn't be the start of a scene. Maybe it should be later in the adventure or not be in it at all, particularly if nobody has a move object power. Think smarter, not harder. To go further along these lines, let's take a look at the statistics of a roll. If I wanted to make a DC check at DC 25, there's no way to succeed without at least a plus five bonus to a skill check. Even then, 
that would be just succeeding, maybe not even succeeding well. If none of your characters are trained in the investigation skill, then it's highly unlikely for them to succeed. I would recommend keeping the DC check at 15 or 20 in our example, unless the character has a plus 8 or more in a skill. There should be a multitude of ways to accomplish a scene as well. This is a game of superheroes with an endless number of ways to solve a problem. I could have a flying dog on my team with a sentient psychic microwave and I can have a sponge that's immortal, right? Why limit the characters in their creativity if you're going to let them be anything that they want to be? There's numerous creative ways to be able to accomplish a scene in characters should feel like their point of view is being recognized. You know, why search for clues when you can get psychic impressions of what happened here? Or have a sorcerer character who can speak to the victim as a ghost? Or use time travel to view what had previously occurred? Now, it's very easy to see all these examples and say, this adventure system is just far too complicated because... How am I supposed to stat out somebody speaking to a dead character? The beauty of that goes into my original discussions about descriptors and assigning a base effect to a power to establish what it is. There's only a limited number of power options. Sure, the flavor text can be whatever you want, but I don't see any reason why speaking to the dead couldn't be a persuasion check. And I don't see why getting psychic impressions of what had previously happened here, it's the exact same thing. You're still using your perception skill rather than investigation skill in order to pick out clues based on emotional impressions. They're just using the same format in a different way. And to be honest with you, as a game master, a useful shorthand can be to set all of the checks that you're going to do to have the same difficulty check number. Because because that's something that people get bogged down in when you have number crunchy systems. Is what's the effect rank of talking to a uh, dead spirit who potentially doesn't want to be in their attitude? It, it doesn't matter. Just set all of them to 15. None of the players will notice. The next thing I want to discuss is a role playing aspect I rarely get into with these videos. How players describe their skill checks is paramount for their engagement and understanding of the rules. Because of this, GMs should recognize the proper formula for skill checks. You'd be surprised how often people completely misunderstand skill checks, roles, and interpreting these roles, which just further serves to complicate encounters for game masters and players. So, here's a handy three-step guide. So, firstly, players should be able to describe what they are trying to do. If a bomb is going off, and the goal is to disarm it, the players should not just say, I want to roll to stop the bomb. They should at least come up with some way to explain how they did it so that the GM can further describe the narrative. Because what happens on a failed roll where the GMs now have to describe the failure? You So you failed, so you didn't stop the bomb? Or they now have to introduce, well, you tried to stop the bomb, but it turns out the wire you chose was wrong. It just... It doesn't flow in with a natural conversation. Secondly, in a system like this, it's best to describe the cause based on the effect, i.e., the role is determining the successfulness of the action. So it might be more appropriate to describe the description of the action taken based on the role and let the scene be colored by the success or failure. For example, I had a player that said, I want to aim a bullet right between my opponent's eyes and fire and they are performing a standard attack action. So this was a major problem. Why? Because if we're going to roll for it, there's still a chance for success or failure. How do you miss a point blank shot between an opponent's eyes? Or worse, how do you land an attack and their toughness save means they do not get injured from it? This then devolved into a discussion about how a regular human can't survive that attack which is a fair point, but is not appropriate for the game master table. Instead, I should have clarified that the player is rolling to shoot the opponent with their gun. And if they chose to use a power attack a, or a finishing attack, or if they even rolled a critical hit, I would give it the description of shooting them between the eyes. 
So thirdly, this is on a more metagaming tangent. Another topic that is invaluable in establishing skill checks is should you railroad your players? I think it should only depend on the experience level of the players. Because when your players forget that stealth is a skill, because this is their first tabletop role-playing experience, I think it's totally fine to direct them along a certain path. Otherwise, they're liable to never get there. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had people playing their first game or their first encounter, and they don't even remember all of the skills or all of the abilities that they have. So the final topic I want to discuss in this video is complications. So it's a critical part of the narrative. Complications, along with Game Master Fiat's, are a part of the hero point economy of this game. Hero points are useful in so many ways that having them throughout the encounter is paramount to enjoyment and player engagement. Now, I don't need to explain what hero points do, but gathering them and sparsing them out between each campaign, each adventure, is critical to a successful encounter. So one should typically provide opportunities for Game Master Fiat throughout the adventure. You're going to be playing on your hero's weaknesses to provide them opportunities to grow more experienced as role players and to learn more ways to play their character. As a Game Master, you were very likely there when they created their character, and I'm sure as you've played alongside them, you've understood that every player has weaknesses in the way that they play their character. It's all part of establishing the personalities of their characters. So you can play on those weaknesses in order to get a better investment in the encounter. They can also be provided in the lead up to a final boss battle. The trope of an all is lost moment in a narrative where the characters are at their lowest is the perfect time to hand out hero points. If they're arguing with each other, if they're just about to break, if they reach some astounding realization after a defeat and it brings the characters together, all of those should be opportunities for role-playing encounters and they should be awarded like candy before the final fight because there's nothing people like more than if they're being brought to their lowest, being brought to their highest, and there's no greater prize than a hero point because of how useful it can be in your final encounter. And if it's in the final fight in the boss battle, they're liable to use them with impunity to create all sorts of different effects, which is just another way to get engagement in the game. Once again, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing, leaving comments, liking. Please uh, bread the word, not spread, bread the word. Because I do it for the listeners, the viewers, and the subscribers. Check out the blog, the podcast, the drive through RPG link, the Twitter, the social media, and participate in the conversation. See you guys later.